Hey there, uh, happy Friday Facebook Live day. I am Julie Hirschberg, the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy, a neurologic PT and wellness practice in Los Angeles. And I'm actually at our Torrance Clinic today and I almost like hope you can hear what is happening right now because we have our re-burn, it's an intense, cardio class for people with neurologic disorders and our instructor who's amazing Zaritza she is actually having them like drum and beat while exercising so while they're doing their cardio they're drumming and beating along and it sounds awesome um so I hope you hear that in the background um, but that just gives you a little glimpse into the kind of fun that we have here at uh reactive and what we're going to dive into today is one of my favorite topics, and it's the second in a series that we've been doing to Nancy Druitt in Neurologic Physical Therapy, and that's differential diagnosis. And the reason we dive into these things is because we actually have a fellowship program for physical therapists to study and grow in their depth of knowledge and movement disorders. So. Uh, this is one of the key topics is recognizing a movement disorder and being ever able to differentially diagnose that. Um, so this kicks off part of the topics that we're going to start in the new year as part of our fellowship and helps us to achieve our mission of improving the care for people with neurologic disorders because we just want to share uh, what we learn, what we're doing, and really share it with the world. So uh, last week, we talk about, talked about differential diagnosis and functional movement disorders. And one of the pieces that we talked about was tremor. And we're going to go a little deeper into tremor today, but talk about it not, in a, not necessarily in a functional context, but tremor, myoclonus, chorea, hemibolism, all of these words that maybe you've heard or you've seen, but don't know always how to attach a specific word to a movement. That's what we're talking about today. And as I mentioned last week, I love Nancy Drew. And I love her because of the way she really is so curious and she won't stop until she finds all of these clues. And so in our differential diagnosis process, as physical therapists, as neurologic physical therapists, we really look for these clues. And in movement disorders, we see them in movement. So that's what we're going to, Nancy Drew today, is looking at the movements. And I know from our own practice that sometimes we see some pretty funky stuff. And it's difficult to name it. Like, is that a tremor? Is that a myoclonic jerk? Is that apoptosis? Is it dystonia? Is it dyskinesia? So we're going to try to tackle that today. And I know that's a lot. And because it is a lot, we've actually developed a process, a step-by-step -step to help with this. And I'll show you it here. Hopefully this is in the camera view. Not that you can read this, but I actually decided to make this a download so that you can have this. After going through it, um, as I prepared for a live video today, I thought, you know what, everybody needs this. So I'll talk through this as we go, but we had made a cheat sheet as we've been working through this in our fellowship. And the, the process can be really in depth. We're not going to go through the whole thing today. Um, but the download, by the way, if you go to our education page, page on reactivept.com, you'll see a link to it right up at the top. It's our, our movement analysis cheat sheet. Um, but basically, we have two different sides to it. So if you saw that there, we've got the one side here, which we're going to go through today, which is the differential diagnosis to characterize movement. And the second is, is our bread and butter. I think you already got this, but this is that biomechanical strategy. Because the thing is, we need to do both at once. So I wanted both of them on the worksheet. So uh, we've got a both here, but we're going to we're gonna hang out on this side and answer these questions for movement analysis in movement disorders. So let's start with this process. We go through a series of questions essentially to get through this. And the first question we ask 
is, when we are seeing a movement and trying to characterize it, is it a problem of not enough movement, insufficient movement, or too much movement? So something I think we're very familiar with are the insufficient movements, like the hypokinesia, bradykinesia, akinesia. We might see this in Parkinson's, for example. And I think most of us know what that looks like and what that, those words mean. Now, if it's too much movement, now we want to subclassify that. So first we want to go not enough or too much. And then if it's too much, we can further subclassify this into jerky movements versus non-jerky movements. And this isn't movements like, hey, you're a jerk. Not at all. Uh, this terminology and a lot of this process is from a really great article. It's available free full text online, so I'll put the link in here. Um, a really great article summarizing this for neurologists. Now, we've adapted it for a physical therapist, but this terminology is very common in the movement disorder wor world as jerky or non-jerky. So what would be an example of something that's jerky? So a myoclonic jerk, maybe that's an obvious one because it's in the name, but myoclonic jerk would be a jerky movement. Chorea, bolism, ticks, those would all be classified as jerky movements. And then non-jerky movements would be something like dystonia or tremor. So let's go through a little definition there. So myoclonus often looks like a shock-like movement. It's sudden and it's brief. Versus chorea are more randomly flowing jerks. They're still abrupt, they're unpredictable, they're usually non-rhythmic, and they're resulting from this continuous random flow of muscle contractions. And they can change from one body part to another. So we see this a lot in um, the people that we work with with Huntington's disease. Ticks are a stereotyped movement. And they the, the thing about ticks, and so again, these fall under the jerky movements, they are typically preceded by some sort of urge that is relieved by the actual movement, and it can be suppressible. This can make a tick difficult to distinguish in a functional disorder, for example, uh, where we can see uh, suppressibility as well. Now, in the non-jerky movements, we've talked a lot about dystonia before. Dystonia is that abnormal, uh, involuntary contraction of muscles that can cause a sustained abnormal posture or twisting. Sometimes it can be repetitive as well, and so it could become like a tremor, for example. And then that leads us to tremor. So tremor has a characteristic of rhythmicity. It's rhythmic and alternating movements of one or more body parts. And because we called this topic today is this tremor, I wanted to go into a little more detail on tremor. Um, it is involuntary and rhythmic. I, I think that's very, very important. It can also involve things other than a limb. So it could be a head, a chin, even the soft palate. Uh, the oscillations occur at a regular frequency. And this is very important. And now there's actually some um, iPhone apps that um, help to classify that exact rhythm and frequency. It's not always perceptible. Uh, to the naked eye. So I think it's very helpful sometimes to have other ways to measure that for people. Um, but they have a fixed frequency. And if you remember from our last week where we talked about differential diagnosis and functional movement disorder, a functional tremor can actually change frequencies and it can be entrained is a word that we use so if you have a tremor at a specific frequency and you start moving to another frequency it would uh, start moving at the frequency in the other arm and that's entrainability and that would be more indicative of a functional tremor so that solid uh, frequency of the of a, of a physiological tremor, uh, Parkinsonian tremor, essential tremor, um, that's part of the diagnosis. Now, something that can change in tremor 
is the amplitude. So you may notice uh, for somebody with Parkinson's that they have a very low amp amplitude rhythmic tremor, but it might increase in amplitude with stress, for example. So that is the hallmark of, uh, of a tremor. And we won't go into detail here about what's an action tremor and what's a physiologic tremor and what's a dystonic tremor or maybe a combo, but those are all pieces of it. I want to instead give you how, how you would use movement analysis and what you look for in the movement to help you classify that. So we took a little detour down tremor. Uh, lane, but remember our question. So the first was not enough or too much movement. If it's too much movement, we talked about jerky or non-jerky. Now we want to characterize the movement that we're seeing. So this brings us to that third question. How do you characterize the movement? And I want to give you some key pieces. First, and maybe the most obvious, is identifying the body part involved. So what's the primary, and then what are some secondary or other ones? Um, in the worksheet, I actually give you some key findings that you would uh, look for in the Parkinson Plus syndromes. Rhythmicity. So first was body part. Second is rhythmicity. Is it arrhythmic? Is it regular? Is it irregular? The third thing is the speed of it. So fast, inner, is it kind of an intermediate or is it slow? The amplitude of the movement, is it very large amplitude, medium amplitude? Is it very small amplitude like we might see with Parkinson's? The duration, so how long does it typically last? The pattern, is it repetitive, flowing, is it continual, is it paroxysmal, which just occurs out of the blue, which is something that we talked about with functional movement disorders. Is it daily, Is it does it relapse and remit, so that you see it sometimes and then you don't see it other times, or it's triggered, and again, these are some things that we looked at with the functional movement disorders. Is it induced by a stimuli? Is it complex or simple tick? So that's very specific to a tick. Is it suppressible? Are there sensory tricks or can it be suppressed with distraction? Is it accompanied by a sensation? So like an urge or a restlessness like we talked about in a tick. Do you see it at rest? <coughs> Excuse me. Or action or both? So again, these are all ways that we're gonna characterize it. And then is it present during sleep? So is it sleep only, uh, something that you might see with a REM sleep behavior, or is it you know, all of the time and it persists in sleep? All of these characterizations of a movement disorder help us to differentially diagnose what is going on. And I found when we started putting these together, so um, Ali Elder and I started working on this about three years ago. And a big impetus was, this was when Ali and I were closely working on the fellowship. She just had a baby, by the way. So, um, so she's got all of her own new movements to analyze with this new baby. I'm so happy for her. But when we were diving into this in the fellowship, what we found is that we would see these odd movements, especially in a functional movement disorder, and not know how to describe them. This gave us the language. So just to review those again, we have the body part, rhythmicity, the speed, amplitude, the duration, the pattern of it, stimuli induced or not, complex or simple, suppressible, what happens with distraction, the sensations that it was accompanied by at rest or action or both, and its presence during sleep. So these were not things that I considered when I first learned gait analysis and movement analysis, right? Like these were not the the, the pieces of language that I learned, and I certainly didn't use this until we really dove into movement disorders. And I think if you are working with a lot of people with movement disorders, this is a very helpful framework. So I'm going to highly recommend this. Again, you can go to reactivept.com slash education. It's the first link up there. It's our advanced movement analysis uh, cheat sheet or worksheet. It's very, very simple. Um, 
but so helpful to have a really nice breakdown of that, of that movement analysis process. So again, these are the steps. Um, if we want to go, is this tremor? Is this a jerk? What is happening here? This is our advanced movement analysis. We look at too much or not enough movement. That's our first question. If it's, if it's too much movement, is it jerky or non-jerky? And then we need to characterize the movements, the body part, rhythm, speed, amplitude, all those things that I just told you. And then this will then help you sort through, and I'm again, I'm gonna highly recommend this article, and I'll post the link here. This will help you sort through and screen for differential diagnosis and movement disorders. Again, I know that we're not making the diagnosis, but we do need to characterize that movement and make the appropriate referrals. So I will link to that article. I'll also put up a link for um, that cheat sheet uh, here in the comments as well. And I would love to hear from you what kind of movements are difficult to characterize and um, maybe we can all solve those uh, together. Uh, thanks so much for, for tuning in. Uh, by the way, I you know totally forgot about this, but we actually uh, just went live with all of our education uh, sessions for next year and we've got quite a bit up there advanced movement analysis is actually going to be one of our mini courses so we will dive in very deep for that um, in February I believe our first course is going to be differential diagnosis of dystonia and that's with Alan Wu and that's coming up in January and then we will dive into some of these other movements with a lot of videos to test this out and I find that so helpful and so helpful and fun to do with uh, with a group so um, you can take a look at, at those also on our uh, website and we hope to see you in them next year and thanks so much for joining I will see you next Friday